Uh, good morning everyone, my name is Barney Johnson, I'm a classical composer and though I have moved out of Paris as of end of August 2022 and I'm living in Anneau Seba, I'm actually in Paris at the moment because my mom uh, is coming through from the US to see some family in Germany and she's passing through Paris probably just to see me but also it's cheaper. And so last night we got to see an opera. I'm so happy. It's my first opera of the season. I saw Bellini's. I cannot even pretend to pronounce the name of this opera, but basically it's like Romeo and Juliet, except it's, there's more of a focus on the families, uh, more about it's less on the actual love between the lovers, but rather between the two disputing families, okay? So it's by Bellini who was an Italian composer. I think this opera was written in the mid, either in the 1830s or the 1840s or the 1850s. So the, the center of the 19th century, okay? It's not considered like a chef d'oeuvre, meaning a, a master opera or anything like that, but um, it is a standard opera, I would say. And I would definitely bring, you know, someone who just wants, you know, to know, you know, an introduction to opera, this would be perfectly fine. Um, I saw that the Aprobasti, the orchestra was really good. The conductor, very good. I forget her name. It's Simone Neal. I have to double check, but she, I've actually seen her before and she brings so much great energy. Like it's like, she reminds me a lot of the conductor at the Philharmonie de Paris. I think it's at the Orchestra de Paris. It's Klaus, um, what's his name? Klaus Michaela. He also, like, he just comes in and does, like, this radiant energy, and she has that, too. And then someone, like, called her name or did something, ah! and she's, like, like, <laughs> she did, like, a look to the audience and a thumbs up right before she started conducting. I thought that was pretty cool. So, um, and then the chorus, as always, they always sound fucking fantastic. I do not remember the name. I won't even try to pronounce the name of the chorus master, but she's a woman from Taiwan, I think, and she is fucking fantastic. So, um, also the set. I think it was by this Robert Karsten with it. This set was phenomenal. I love the vibrant red for me. I need a good set. If I do not like the set, then I'm not gonna be happy. The last opera I actually saw in Paris was like in July or in June. It was Rameau, uh, his opera Platé. Um, the, I did not like the set, okay? But the music was so good that it didn't matter. But listen, not every opera is going to be that good. That doesn't matter if the set isn't good. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to tell you what are some of the things I took away from... I hope the lighting isn't out of control. Um, what are some of the things I took away from my experience at the opera um, and how am I going to use it in my second opera? So if you remember from my other videos, if you're a loyal subscriber, I have two operas I'm currently working on. I have my first opera, Atala, which is an ad going to be an adaptation of a short story written by Chateaubriand, who is a French writer who lives like at the end of the monarchy into the revolution and, and into the new, new republic. And um, so for that, I'm taking a short story and adapting it for the operatic stage. Now, my second opera, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, is Le Bateau, which means like the ship or the, the boat. And for that opera, uh, I'm creating everything from, everything from scratch. I'm creating uh, the story, I'm creating the libretto, which is like the script, and then I'm creating the, um, the music, of course, okay? And I will link like in the description below, you can see my previous video on this. I have two videos, uh, part one, part two, where I give the whole background of the project, why I'm doing it, why I'm not scared, of writing my own libretto, I am scared, but why I, I'm not scared, um, what I'm hoping to, to gain, why am I doing it, um, what are some of the themes, the characters, so I urge you to check that out to save more context. Okay, my train uh, back to Bordeaux is leaving in about like an hour and a half or something, it, so I have to like leave to get to Montparnasse rather soon, so it's gonna be a quickie, but quickie does not always mean bad. Oh, so beautiful. Oh, love it. I miss Paris, but listen, I had to leave. Okay, so what are the things I'm going to um, take away? Uh, first and foremost, 
the power of a chorus is just cannot be denied. They had a men's chorus. I don't think they had a women's chorus. I did not really hear female voices in the chorus. Um, there's something very powerful about men singing together, especially when it's really loud. I noticed especially when they were um, up in front of the audience, like at the front of the stage, there is something very powerful and visceral about that. You just feel it energetically. And I definitely want to utilize that in Le Bateau. Uh, that actually inspired a, um, a scene that um, I hadn't thought about. And I want to deal with shame because this opera has to do with shame a little bit because the main character, Marcel, is homosexual. He's not ashamed at all, but he, he leaves his home country to look for treasure for the king. And in this new place, uh, homosexuality is just very, very, very much a taboo. Um, though I may not refer to it directly by name, but it'll be very clear that, you know, there's a sin, a sin. Because opera is all about, like, sin and, like, these, these, these old themes like that. So I definitely think it'd be very powerful to have a whole group of men talking about the sin and your country and think about your family and think about uh, the evil. And I think that'd be to, to really see like oppression when a group of people, like a group of people can do great wonder, but they can also do great evil. And I want the audience to see what happens when a mass can band together because they think something's wrong or immoral. So I think that idea of shame, you know, a whole men's chorus would be very powerful, especially if they're moving towards the audience. So that's something to think about. Um, I do love a woman's chorus, and I was a bit disappointed they didn't have a woman's chorus, but that's my own expectation. Um, I know, especially in opera, if you have start off with a men's chorus, and then later you bring in the woman's chorus, it's such a nice effect. Like I think Wagner does that, in, um, what's that, um, the Flying Dutchman. The, the women come in in the second act and all of a sudden it's like these beautiful angelic voices. So um, I will think, you know, I do have to think about that, but I don't know, we'll see. Because it is kind of a gay opera, so there will be women, but I don't know if I want a whole woman's chorus, okay? Um, harp, okay, the harp is a magical instrument. You have to be strategic when you whip it out, okay? So definitely, this is more the case in ballet. In ballet, whenever you bring out the harp, it's like, you have to wait for the right moment. Because once you bring it out, it's like, oh my God, it just, it just brings the whole opera or the whole ballet to another level. So I definitely, and it's something I'd already learned just going to see ballet, but I definitely consciously need to think about the harp. The harp is typically used for love scenes. So, um, the challenge though is this is a gay opera so the two the main characters are gay and i think for two men to have the sound of a harp it, it's not really i i want to explore like this beautiful masculinity you know i don't want something feminine so a, the sound of the harp i don't it could just render the love scene way too cheesy if it's um, between two men. And I think people might think it's a little silly. So I, I, will, I will look at it. I have to think about that more. I, maybe I could use the harp for um, maybe the second act because there are there's a female lead who is kind of a, plays a savior role and she is persecuted for her crimes, which is homosexuality. So maybe I might have a scene with her lover. I don't know um, if I'll even show her lover because it is more focused on Marcel and Mehdi, uh, which you would see, you would know if you had watched the video, I already did, so make sure you click on that video. Um, so definitely, I need to think about the harp. I fucking love the harp. I love the harp. So I gotta think, when am I gonna bring out that harp? Because I want it to have a special effect, and people notice it. People, the audience will all, if you say, do you remember when the harp came? Oh yeah. So I'm gonna definitely use the, the power of the harp uh, in my opera, Avoir, means, to be talked about later. Um, shame scene, I think I already talked about that um, with the men's chorus, but I definitely, because this opera is dealing with um, partly just oppression of foreigners, you know, when you go to another land and being treated like shit, but also, you know, um, crimes, you know, crimes, you know, in this case, homosexuality, I think it would be great to have a shame scene. And there's another character that I've developed called Karim, who I believe will be the brother of Mehdi, who is, of course, Marcel's lover. And the brother is going to play an integral role in kind of really condemning um, 
Mehdi, because Mehdi's tied, tied because he really loves Marcel, but he also has his family that is saying this is so wrong, it's so evil. And so I think that would be so great dramatically, and I want a scene between Mehdi and um, Karim, the two brothers, and Karim is going to be like the older brother and saying, think about your father, think about your country, this is too dangerous. And I even want something tender where Karim admits for a second, yes, I, my eye has wandered you know, beyond uh, where it shouldn't wander, like something where it hints that he too has delved into this sin. But he says, you can't, you can't do this. You can, you, this is bad for the country. Um, we, you, you, and especially there's a, a, a facet because Marcel is a foreigner that also adds a very bad stain to the legacy of the country for him to be in love with a foreigner. So definitely I think what's going to happen is Mehdi is a prince of some sort. He's part of royalty. So there's also this theme of, of royal blood that I'd like to explore. Opera has to look back to the past, and that's certainly the case here. Um, so I definitely want a shame scene. I definitely will need to see more operas where there is a shame scene, where the, a character is being told to choose between their love, their personal feelings, and the country and the family. So I, and I want to see how that plays out. So it doesn't matter what style of opera, I just want to see that play out. So again, I need to keep coming back to Paris to see more opera. Um, solo singing. So I f you would have noticed or remembered from my other video that something I'm very cognizant about is attention span. So I don't want character singing for too long, just one character, because the audience gets bored. I was thinking primarily about Wagner. Um, however, I realized with this opera, it doesn't always have to be the case, and it's actually really useful and really helpful for the audience, because then you hear that one character's, um, their personal feelings, because when there's other characters on stage, right, you're not going to be as open about your feelings when there's other people watching. Well, it's the same thing in an opera, it's still, you know, a stage art form, right? So it mimics reality in a way, and so I do need to think about having solo scenes. Um, the audience, it really helps the audience connect with the, the characters, and we, I really do want that. It also helps the audience to understand where they're coming from, why do they feel. It brings humanity. So even in this opera, the queen, um, which will be Mehdi's mother, probably, who is very much opposed to Marcel, doesn't want Marcel to succeed, is opposed to homosexuality. She's overseeing these trials of sins taking place in her kingdom. Um, I want to humanize her, too, to see that there's humanity in everyone. So I might have to have a solo scene with her, or at least a, a section where we, maybe she'll talk with her son, with um, Mehdi, when she tries to convince him to leave Marcel. I don't know. To be, uh, to be discussed later. Um, scene changes. Um, in this opera, there, it was two acts. So the first act, then intermission, then second act. I, it's really nice and clean like that. I'll see, maybe I'll just do it that way. I've been thinking three acts, but then it creates an imbalance. So that means the second act would have to be a little bit shorter, so that the first half is a little bit longer than the second half. I, I have to see more opera to figure out how the division of acts will be. And I do plan, starting April, April 2nd, my birthday, uh, 2023, I want to start writing the libretto. So right now I'm in research phase, I'm in going to opera phase. The, going to the opera will still continue, of course. Uh, I'm in writing the story, constructing the story. But by April 2nd, my birthday, I'm writing the libretto. And I will start writing some of the music for the non-vocal scenes. Because there's going to be like a dance section in the, in the second after intermission. I want a ballet, okay? I'm going to have a ballet. In my opera, ain't nobody going to stop me. Don't you dare think you're going to prevent me for budgetary reasons from having a ballet. I'll slap you. I'll slap you, okay? Um... So, in regards to scene changes, um, in this opera in Bellini, there were a number of scene changes, and they just kind of, the curtain went down, and then the audience just kind of, you had some, t like a minute or two to kind of ruffle your feathers. That was actually quite helpful, because it is a bit fatiguing to be there for so long. Um, also, like, for example, I told my mom, like, uh, mom, you know, your coat makes too much noise. Can you figure that out? So it, it's actually quite helpful for the audience because it gives us time to check in. Also, I was able to ask my mom, like, was that Romeo I saw or was it the messenger? And then she told me she thinks it's, it's both. And so I realized that's actually, it's very, it's very helpful for the audience to have these kind of pauses while they change the scene. And then they give them time to kind of talk or to, to figure out certain problems. Like if your neighbor's making too much noise, you can take that moment to, um, 
to figure that out. So again, this is why um, I want to create my own opera because I'm thinking from a modern perspective, what are the needs of the audience? It's just not, it's not just dramatic needs, as of course, like just your kind of physical needs, but also bathroom, you know? But of course we can't change that, you know, you have the intermission, okay? You can't get up in the middle of the opera, it's, it's no way. Um, I have been thinking at first when there were scene changes that, well, why not just have music that fills up this time? Certainly musical theater, I, I played in the pit of a musical, uh, in musical theater in my hometown in Jersey. When I was younger, I played cello and tuba in it uh, for the summer drama program. And certainly for that, um, it was like flexible. There were repeat signs, so the, depending on the needs, you could like prolong the scene, the intermediary music or not. Um, I think that would be something cool to do. Of course, opera um, back in the day was much more flexible. They cut scenes all the time. They had like other operas in between. So I think it'll be interesting to have something that's flexible enough that it could adapt with the times. But again, I think it was quite refreshing just to have that pause. So I might, um, I might just do that. So my timer is telling me to shut the fuck up. Uh, I gotta catch my train. Um, okay, what else do I want to say before I leave? Um, oh. Building suspense. So one thing that was really exciting is the first scene they were talking about Juliet and the whoever, the king or I don't know, the leader was saying, I'm gonna give you Juliet. You, she, I'm gonna marry off my daughter to you. As so they keep talking about Juliet, Juliet. And then we get to the next, so this is like 20 or 30 minutes later, there's a scene change and then we see Juliet by herself in her room and she expresses her feelings to the audience. I think that was very powerful because it's just building towards a character instead of just like throwing out the character here and there willy-nilly, it's getting us excited about that character and then she spills her feelings. Again, another reason why I think we need to have, I need to keep solos in this opera because it's very effective to hear directly from the character. So I definitely got to think about in my opera what characters do I want to like build to. So certainly I'm thinking it will start off with Marcel, the main character, but I want to build to the scene when he meets uh, Mehdi. That's going to be a pitiful scene when he first meets his lover for the first time. Just the first love, actually. Um, that actually brings me to something else. Um, I forgot, it'll come back to me. Um, before I go, preludes to the opera. So um, usually in opera, there's a prelude at the beginning and people are still getting to seats and you hear the music. A lot of times the music will have themes, uh, the themes that were used throughout the whole opera to kind of set everything up. It's kind of like a summary of what's gonna happen. It might kind of hint, like if it's a tragedy, there'll be some tragic music at the beginning to hint about where it's gonna end and then it'll start off bright, you know? Um, so definitely this opera had a prelude. What I noticed is at first the curtain's down, so it creates this tension. You want it to get lifted up. So I was thinking um, that's something good to know. So about after three to five minutes into my scene, the, the prelude, I need to imagine that the curtain, uh, I'll put an indication in the libretto, I want the curtain to go up. And then, don't start singing right away, it's nice that the music is continuing, but now you get to see the scene, you see people walking by, you, you just get into the, 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 the land. I think that's really helpful. Ballet is especially that the case, because there is no singing at all. It's all, you know, pantomime, or it's all, like, suggested. Um, so, I definitely, I, I want to do that. Okay, I gotta get on this train. But my battery is about to die out anyway, so that's going to be what gets you on the train. Um, yeah, I really, I really want, I want to have that prelude, really something nice. I want something just like not too hard for the orchestra because I do want some virtuosic sections for the orchestra. Definitely uh, right before intermission, I want the orchestra going batshit crazy, okay? When Marcel gets betrayed, and they burn the painting of his mother, orchestra's going batshit crazy. And then as well, in the dance section, after intermission, I want orchestra very active. Everyone gets a roll, two will so you get a roll, everyone has fun. So um, the prelude, I'll, I'll kind of keep it calm. But, you know, um, exciting. Um, 
Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's what I want to say. So what I realized is the first person or group that sings, that's very important, right? Because the, there's attention in a way because we go to hear and see the singers, right? They're the stars, even though there's a whole backbone that makes it happen. So there's a prelude. They open the curtains. The prelude continues. It doesn't have to happen the way, but it's how it happened with Berlin. And I think I'll be stealing that idea. It's not even stealing. I mean, it's standard way. And um, then, at some point, someone needs to break the ice. Someone needs to sing. So in my head, because I'm noticing that, I have to be very conscious about who's the first person to speak in the opera, right? Because that's really going to set the framework, right? Like, if, especially if you start with a certain group, it's really going to set the mode. Now, I have been thinking in my opera there will be like a prologue, which will see Marcel speaking with his king and being, um, you know, getting permission to leave his country to search for treasure and then being sent off on the ship and then it kind of starts. But I have to think about budgetary reasons. Is it really economical to have a solo king for just, you know, 10 minutes and then he never appears again? I need, I need more information on that. If anyone knows, you can uh, book. That would be really helpful. But of course, you know, it's, that's my job. Okay, to figure that out. Um, but now I have to think, who is the first person going to sing? And how can I build tension so that when the first person sings, the audience feels a sense of satisfaction, right? I want you to be, you have to always play with tension resolution. That's what Western art is founded on. It's tension resolution, tension resolution, okay? But you can't go too far either way. Uh, one final thing I'm really thinking about, there's a couple other things, but I'm not going to talk about it just yet, um, is attention spans. I'm just so focused on attention spans because, you know, it's the 21st century. Unfortunately, technology has lowered our attention spans. It's really quite atrocious. I think we need to all work against that. Like right now, my cell phone hardly even works, so no one texts me, and it's wonderful, and I like to keep it that way. I notice I have less anxiety in my life because I don't have to look to see if someone respond to my texts. I don't need it. I haven't been using Facebook lately because I don't have a desire. So we can't force people to get off technology, but we have to start seeing that there's something more potent. Like I love reading literature right now. I think partly it's just for survival because I don't have a job. I need to get a job. I need to finish my orchestra piece. So this technology would stress me out anyway. But I am focused on attention spans and making sure the opera um, can fit people's attention spans for today and hopefully even fit people's attention spans for future generations. Assuming it's going to get worse and worse and worse. But hey, I can only do so much. Um, so one thing I realized is there's a lot of like shifting in the seats. First of all, people cough throughout the opera. You can't get mad at them for that. Um, though it is like quite you know, since COVID, people get quite triggered. But now I think people have calmed down. Right, you know, when they first open up cultural venues after all the lockdowns, if anyone dared cough, <laughs> that was basically grounds to get expelled, okay? People would have protested. So you have to assume there will be coughing. That does take away from the experience just a little bit. Um, there was a guy in front of me who anytime anyone rustled in their, their seat, he would like start to turn around and get distracted. I honestly, even though he was a bit anal and crazy about that, I totally understand because my last uh, semester in Paris, I was just so stressed and unhappy. So when I went to the opera, it was like my getaway, like my like, you know, time away from myself, my vacation. So if people were making noise or anything disruptive, it really triggered me. So uh, I think it's just really stressful right now for people in Paris. But we have to think about writing music that can kind of pass through that. That doesn't mean there's going to have to be exposed sections. But I think if we generally have like kind of quote, ambient noise in the music or something where it's continuous, you know, and there's it's, it's a certain mezzo forte level with never too quiet, then when you do have a really quiet still scene, I think the audience will put more effort to stay still. And also we have to keep in mind, in the back in the day when opera was first, you know, being produced, um, it wasn't like this silent um, audience. That's something that came, I think, Toscanini was really big in that, trying to get silence, we need silence. So it used to be like people playing games, people were talking, um, 
it was definitely more of a social experience. Though, of course, the artistry may have, I think, would have had to suffer. I don't think they had the quality performances that they have now. So, um, another thing is like people need to take off their coat because sometimes you sit down in the opera hall and it, it's like you don't have your coat on but i always get cold throughout the performance so i know to keep it on but my mother did not know that and then she was like shifting i was like mom stop it but it's fine i shouldn't talk smack you know but i want to in my opera la bateau just be really cognizant of these things because though this time i'm technically on vacation you know i'm not working you know, my mom was gracious, gracious enough to, to pay for my opera ticket and for my, you know, for our hotel lodgings. So I'm kind of at peace in that way, but that's not always the case. You know, if you're working full time and then you have to rush out of work to make it to the opera, right? Because it starts at 7.30 usually in Paris. You don't have time to eat. You really have to factor in all these things that could create stress for the person. So if you can kind of have kind of music very involved enough in the way that people aren't scared to take out a cough drop <laughs> because sometimes you need to get a cough drop just to get energy because you're falling asleep right so um, again tension attention span is something i'm really really focused on uh, i think that's going to be my biggest like i feel quite ready to write this opera but uh, i'm not ready <laughs> but i feel like i have enough of the certainly musical aptitude and understanding of opera but i want to understand more the experience of the the, the the opera goer, you know, what it's like. Um, I hope that this was insightful for you. Um, did I say everything I wanted to say? Yes, I did. So I hope this was insightful for everyone. Um, look, I look forward to producing this opera, Le Bateau. I think I said in the previous video I wanted mounted within seven years, which Whenever I said that, it was totally honest. When I saw that video recently, I was like, oh my goodness, seven years. That's very soon because I have to write the libretto. I have to create the story, write the libretto. I want the libretto started this April 2nd uh, for my birthday. And then I think I want it finished by summer. I don't know if that's possible. I've never written a libretto before, but I want, it, I want this moving. And then I think what I'll do is I'll just start writing the music, but I won't orchestrate it. So I'll write the music for like um, for the piano and the singers, and then once I have a commission, then I'll orchestrate it, and I will also charge them for the music that I had already written and that wasn't paid for. Okay, listen, this is going to be great music, and I need to be compensated. I wish it could be compensated right now, but I will get compensated at some point. Barney Johnson, classical composer. Have a wonderful day.